I will be forever the myth. You're the king of kings, <laughs> There's always a pecking order. The little peckers never mess with the big peckers. So I'm a rooster, and he's a chicken for the week. All right, welcome back to the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. And my special guest this week is Mr. John Little. And John was uh, a writer for Flex Magazine. And he wrote uh, several books that we're going to talk about today, including books about Mike Menser, who's going to be our main subject, and also uh, Bruce Lee. So, John, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, John. i got to say I do enjoy your show very much. I've been uh, getting into it during this whole pandemic, so yeah, have been marathoning <laughs> your episodes. Oh, great. Awesome. Glad to hear that. Well, John, I, I thought we'd bring you on to talk about uh, Mike Menser. Mike died, uh, I think it was in 2000, correct? Uh, 2001. 2001, yeah. okay. And he just, yeah. it was uh, this month in June was the anniversary. Yeah, of June time. 10th. Yeah. yeah, June 10th. So uh, we've never had a show where we talk directly about Mike Menser. We've talked a little bit about him. So I thought it would be interesting to have you on since you've written some books about him and everything. Um, when did you meet Mike? Because I was reading one of your books about him, and he, he, you said that you've known him for like 20 years, I guess, before he died, right? Yeah, I, uh, I first met Mike at a bodybuilding, they called it a breakfast seminar in Toronto. Okay. Where, uh, Arnold and Franco and Mike Menser came to Toronto to a Simpsons department store. Okay. And they had a big breakfast seminar. And this was exactly six months prior to the 1980 Mr. Olympia contest. Hmm. And um, they all came out and said a little speech and talked, you know, sort of a micro seminar. And uh, of course, at the time, I knew who Mike was. And, and um, a friend of mine where I live up here was a huge Mike Menser fan. But to me, I was all about Arnold and Zane. Those were my guys. Okay. And, uh, so Mike was, Mike was interesting and, and uh, somewhat professorial in his presentation. Uh, and so I, I took a Super 8 sound movie camera with two rolls of film, which were about five minutes each or something. Okay. And um, I had some friends that were Menser fans, so I felt obliged to get some Mike Menser material. And I videotaped him and, you know, had audio with it. And then, you know, the, the real stars came on. Franco came on and uh, did a little bit and then bent the microphone in half, you know, <laughs> holding onto it with his teeth. And, right. and then, then Arnold came out and the place went crazy, you know. And he yeah. was – because Arnold was the guy. I mean, he was doing movies. He was doing television. He was the undis undisputed king of bodybuilding. Right. And there he was in Toronto, you know. And we, yeah. we used to buy the magazines and – it was all about California, California, California. So I right. was in Toronto. So this was amazing, you know. And so the bulk of, I have one reel, which is nothing but Arnold's seminar or his presentation. And the first reel is about a third Arnold, maybe a third Mike and a third Franco. And, you know, in retrospect, I wished I'd reversed the, the sequence. But, yeah. um, and unfortunately, I've lost the reel that had Mike and Franco on it. Oh, all wow. All these moves I have made but I still have the one with Arnold. So, mm. um, but that was the first time I met him and that was in 1979. And, uh, after Mike had spoken and Arnold had spoken and Franco, um, Arnold and Franco, whew, they were gone. Like okay. took off. Mike stayed behind and, and there was, as they have in these meeting rooms, these banquet rooms, you know, these sliding walls and Mike was behind there. And I noticed that Kathy Gelfo, who was his girlfriend, was right. standing close to the to the door basically so i went up and started speaking to her and she was very gracious and within three minutes mike showed up so we got to talk to him got his autograph he was very nice and he told me when he came over jokingly so oh, i was getting jealous you talking to my girlfriend over there you know and, <laughs> and i said yeah right you know and, and then I remember he repeated that about 10 years later. He goes, no, I really was. He goes, I didn't know who you were talking to over there. So, um, How old were you at that time, John? I, I was uh, first year of college, so I was probably 20. Okay. 20-ish. Mm -hmm. Might have been 21. I think I was 20, though. So, you know, I was uh, I was in my prime, and I was a real threat to Mike Manser <laughs> in terms of the ladies. 
<laughs> but that was the first time I met Mike and he was uh, very, very nice. And uh, I actually got Arnold's autograph that day and Mike's and I was, I was pretty happy. And then I also had the uh, movie film to uh, go yeah. back and I, I must have played it. When I played all the tapes back, the only people, the only um, bodybuilders uh, who, who imparted anything of, of substance was Mike. Hmm. He was talking about the intensity to ratio being inverse and how you can train hard or you can train long, but you can't do both. But it just so happens it takes hard training to build big muscles. I remember this verbatim because I yeah. watched it over yeah. and over. Um, and then Franco came out and he did kind of a silly little demonstration. He called some guy up from the audience and he said, all right, I want you to try and pull your arm up and I'll resist you. So the guy did it and, you know, Franco resisted him. And, and then he goes, all right, now bend your arm up to here. And he put two fingers there and said, try and press. And the guy was having trouble moving Franco. And Franco said, see, your triceps are weak. <laughs> Never mind that you're in a position of insufficiency where you can't engage the muscle. Right. But right. that was Franco's bit. And then Arnold came out. And it was funny, actually, because, you know, Mike was all about intensity. And he had this voice where he talked sort of like this. <clears throat> um, Arnold came out and he looked around. And he saw that Mike was gone. He cleared the stage area. So his opening line to the crowd was, you know how Mike Mensa trains won't work for you. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, Mike peeks his head out from behind the partition and looks at him. But he goes, ah, but then what works for me might not work for you. <laughs> what works for Frank? You have to buy all the books and courses of everybody. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was entertaining that he was uh, right. he sort of caught uh, red-handed right. on that one. <laughs> Did you have uh, – he didn't – Arnold didn't give any indication at all that he would be going in the 80 Olympia, huh? Not at all. And yeah. if someone from the crowd had said – because Franco, you know, quick to peel off his shirt and everybody was applauding. And and the crowd was saying, yo, Menser, Menser, let's do it. You know, take off your shirt. Let's see a pose. And he goes, well – he goes, I'm not in contest shape yet. And he said, but I will if Arnold will. And mm. Arnold was like, no, I'm not interested, you know. And yeah. uh, that was – that was, I mean, Arnold at that point probably knew he would be heading toward the Mr. Olympia contest, but uh, neither one of them were, or Arnold particularly, was not showing his cards at that point. Wow. He said this was about six months, right, before the Olympia? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think it was in April. I think of April. April or yeah. of, I, I uh, remember the, uh, the seminar. Was, it was covered in Muscle Mag, right? Muscle, Muscle Mag, Mag did a, did a write-up yeah. on it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was a good crowd. There was about know, 500 people, 600 people there. Wow, no which, kidding. Uh, wasn't bad. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. But, um, yeah. yeah, that was that was cool. And that sort of turned me a little bit toward Menser. Mm -hmm. Because I thought, um, only when I was watching the films, because I went back to pan the gold, you know, all these bodybuilding secrets that were going to morph me into Arnold Schwarzenegger. And yeah. I just found that he, he didn't, uh, Arnold didn't impart anything. Uh, tangible to me that I could I could apply um, mm. to say you should buy all of the books and courses of all of the different bodybuilders and see what works for you seemed like a, a huge financial burden number one to a <laughs> student but also it was a it was a um, instruction that meant nothing it'd be like yeah. you asking me uh, you know I'm you're in Florida I'm in Ontario and you say, what's the quickest way to get to Ontario, John, if I want to visit you? And I say, well, geez, you could take a canoe, you could take a helicopter, you could take a right. plane. I mean, you really should try all the different forms of transportation <laughs> and find out which one works best for you. Right, right. So it was, uh, that was my experience with Arnold. And then, of course, the 80 Olympia happened, and that, um, that raised an eyebrow, certainly, on my part. And yeah. uh, I got to know Mike better throughout the years after that. More as a friend than just a fan, you know. Wow. So you, you became friends with him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I was impressed with the way he, um, he dealt with people. Like mm -hmm. he was, you know, at that time, his star was at its zenith in the Weeder publications. Yeah. And yet yeah. He, he stayed behind to talk to whoever and whoever wanted to speak with him for as long as they wanted to. Yeah. And very free with whatever advice he had. And I think... He really enjoyed talking to bodybuilders who were as um, awestruck with bodybuilding as he was. Hmm. He was its biggest fan. You know, the, whatever magic you experienced when you first got into bodybuilding, that enveloped Mike. He, hmm. he loved that. 
And, um, you know, for some of us, like myself, become quite cynical over the ages, you know, but there's, yeah. there's other people that hang on to the magic of it and, uh, and still get excited about a, you know, a physique contest or, or a new bodybuilder that has a, another level of development uh, above the rest. Uh, and Mike was that way. Uh, hmm. He just, he loved bodybuilding. Uh, it was his ethos. You know? Wow. Really? Hmm. So when did you become interested in writing then, John? Were you a writer in college? Not really. Uh, the only writing, <laughs> the only writing, I, writing I did. I had a friend in high school who was sort of uh, uh, rebellious, and he used to he used to write these whatever the teacher would ask him to write. He would write it, but it would be just so off track of what the teacher wanted that he wasn't going to get a good grade. But his writing was spectacular. Hmm. And I was so impressed with his writing, and I'd go home and try and emulate it <clears throat> on certain essays, but. No, I had no uh, dreams of being a writer at all. In fact, my, my coming into writing and bodybuilding occurred at about the same time that uh, Mike Menser disappeared from bodybuilding. Oh, okay. And, and at the time, I thought, where is, where is the voice of high-intensity training? We don't, it's not in the publications. Yeah. And so I happened to meet the acquaintance of Chris Lund, who was a bodybuilding photographer yeah. for Bob Kennedy. Mm -hmm. later for Weeder. But Chris was very popular because he was the only bodybuilding photographer that had a Hasselblad camera. So the, the photographs were amazing. You know, yeah, they were. Black they and were. whites were like, you could see every bead of sweat. Yeah. And uh, he and I became friends. And over time, he, be he took over the editorship of a British bodybuilding publication called Bodybuilding Monthly. Okay. And uh, Part of his gig was the more photographs he could get in the magazine, the more he got paid. But you need articles for that. So he'd say, oh, can you write something on, you know, this or that? And mm. said, yeah, sure. Okay, that'd be kind of fun. And I went <laughs> and covered uh, one of the Olympus, uh, Mr. Olympia contests in Columbus, Ohio. Might have been, gosh, might have been 1990 or 89 or one of those years. No, it had to be before that, 86 or 85. 86 and, probably, yeah. Yeah, and it was, I got, so I wrote about the contests, uh, but I, he also allowed me a bit of latitude so I could write about training. And mm. so I would go into the physiology lab at McMaster University and pour through all the physiology stuff and mm. uh, tie it to what Mike Menser had advocated. Like if I found writings on intensity versus duration from, let's say, Arthur Steinhaus, who was a, a, a guy who taught in Illinois, Great. And one of the sort of the pioneering exercise physiologists in the United States. Okay. Uh, I just, I found that it was, it, it dovetailed beautifully. Hmm. So I used to write these articles on, you know, intensity training, high intensity training and anatomy and all this stuff. And Chris could then throw his photographs in, you know, and, and so yeah. it was nice. And that eventually caught the attention of Joe Weider and he asked me to go to California and write for him. So wow. that's okay. what I ended up doing. Wow. That's amazing. So, what did you think of the 1980 uh, Mr. Olympia result, John? Because this was like six months after. Well, I thought it was great. Mike. I thought it was the best, most honest run contest I've ever seen. <laughs> <No>. The <laughs> highlights, was, the IPB. <laughs> yeah, no, it was. Uh, well, I got a lot of mixed feelings about the 1980 Olympia, and uh, I'm beholden to you for your research and speaking to a lot of the people that were there on your podcast. Um, that's been an education for me. Uh, I've always known, of course, what Mike's views were, but to get them substantiated by other competitors yeah. was an eye-opener. Um, my view on the contest at the time was that Arnold should not have won. Mm -hmm. um, and that was largely from the articles that were coming out at the time, like Jack yeah. Neary's piece. Jack Neary, um, yeah. And uh, I was surprised that Menser didn't, because I think he clearly was the favorite going into 1980 with particularly with Zane's accident. Yeah, um, right. He You're seemed to be the, the, the guy that, okay, he's, he's the one to keep your eye on. Yeah. And then to find out he got fifth place, it was like, like yeah. I might even have been able to accept it if he'd gotten second place. And you say, right. well, it was Arnold, right? Arnold, right, Arnold, right. Arnold. But, but then when you, when you look at the contest and you see that Arnold didn't even do the, the compulsory poses, that, that's like hitting a ball 
in baseball and refusing to touch the bases. You know, you don't count the run. Right. Um, so at, at the very least, he should have been marked down for that round and probably disqualified. And if you believe what Frank Zane said to you, uh, Dennis Stallard did disqualify him. Yeah. And, and rather than respect the officials on the stage, they instead fired Stallard, sent, yeah. sent him back to Wales. That was amazing that, when Frank me, said that. That, I, that to me shocked. smacks of corruption, you know, yeah. and the, the judging panel was certainly all friends of Arnold. Um, and the uh, Brendan Ryan uh, substitution, um, where he gave Arnold perfect scores in, um, in the first round where he should have been marked down for symmetry issues or proportion issues. Yeah. He didn't do, he didn't do the, the mandatory poses and he got a perfect score for that, for not <laughs> doing them. Right. Uh, and then in the posing round where Arnold, you know, would have excelled because even if he had weak points, he was savvy enough to know how to cover them and, and the body parts that were very well developed. He didn't, you know, he was fantastic at showing it. Right. But instead he got marked down in the posing round. Yeah. You know, which is, bizarre yeah and then correct me if i'm wrong on this but my experience when i covered contest was that really the first three rounds determined the contest the pose down is to give the judges time to tally their scores it's kind of right. it's a bone to throw to the crowd right so i guess during that period at the, at the pose down he got more points yeah which yeah. i don't know but anyway perfect scores you know he arnold was sort of the the uh, antipode of Tom Platts. You know, Platts had the big legs, upper mm -hmm. body wasn't in proportion. Right. Arnold had the big upper body, but the legs weren't in proportion. Right. In the same way that Platts got marked down and penalized over his career, Arnold in that contest should have, should have been marked down as well. Yeah. Um, so my thought on the 1980 Mr. Olympia, to answer your question, is, is simply not that you know, so-and-so Mike or Frank or Boyer should have won, but that Arnold should not have won. Yeah. That's basically my conclusion. Yeah. That's, that, that's what Boyer coach said. It wasn't like, he didn't really know who should have won, but he just, they all felt like Arnold shouldn't have won. Yeah. And they all, it's interesting. I, you know, I, I looked at your interviews with these champions pretty thoroughly mm -hmm. and, um, and who they picked. And these are, these aren't fans. These are guys that have been in the trenches. They know what it takes to win an Olympia in the case yeah. of Samir or Chris Dickerson or Frank Zane, who's, who won it three times. Yeah. So by an actual highest possible level bodybuilder standard, they didn't have Arnold in the top five. Right. All of them had Menser in the top three or as vying for first place. Mm -hmm. well, what's it mean? Nothing, unfortunately, because it's in the books, but... Uh, you had said something in your podcast, which uh, struck a resonant chord with me. And you said, I forget whose podcast it was. Um, forgive me for that. But you were being interviewed and, and this fellow raised a, a good question. He said, so even if Arnold was out, there's no way Menser was going to win the contest, right? It was, it was Dickerson. Yeah. And you said, well, it depends on the judges, right? Yeah. Different set of judges, just like the bodybuilders' opinions, they could yeah. have voted someone else in first very easily. Right. And right. when you look at issues like mass and proportion um, and conditioning, I think Metzer was right in there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. I, I talked to um, uh, Winston Roberts, who was a judge from Canada, a well-respected judge from the IFBB, and I got a chance to interview him right, right before he died, uh, unfortunately. And I was asking him about the 81 Olympia where Franco yeah. won. You were Franco, at that one. And I was at that one, yeah. And Franco had the weak yeah. legs. And he was talking about flats, and he said, yeah, he was, he was out of proportion, so that's why he marked him down. And I, I wish I would have pushed him a little more, you know, when I had the chance, because yeah. I would have said, well, you marked Franco higher, and he had no legs. You know, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> Can you reward a guy for better development than less development? You know, it just doesn't Yeah, make that's sense. right. Yeah, less is, less is okay, but too right. much, you got to draw the line. You know, right, so. right. So as you got a chance to know Mike, you've probably known a lot about his career, right, John? And um, so let, let's talk a little bit about his career for our listeners that aren't aware of Mike. Um, here, I, I just showed you this. I'll show it again for the camera. This is uh, the first, the, one of the first bodybuilding magazines. I think this is the very this first one I've ever bought. Yeah. Huh. This That's is crazy. April 1976, uh, Muscle Builder. 
and Mike was on the cover. And uh, as you said, John G. Mose was the writer. And this was right after Mike was in the um, uh, 1975 Mr. America. Oh, it wasn't Robbie the 76 started. then. It no, it was the 76. Yeah, it was right after 75 that Robbie won. And this was right. Mike's, I guess, first big uh, national uh, contest. And he was right. third place behind Roger Callard and Robbie. And uh, I guess Gene Mose wanted to do an article on him because he was a new face, upcoming star. And he was absolutely shocked, you know, in this interview that how little he trained. He said he only trained three days a week. And at the time, everybody was training six days a week. And everybody was oh, yeah. doing at least 20 sets of body parts. Because I remember this is when I got into bodybuilding and all the articles I read by everybody all said the same thing. They were all doing six yeah. days a week, training each muscle group two to three times. <laughs> a week. And then Menser comes along and he goes, no, I'm only training – three days a week, and I'm only doing, yeah. like, five sets of body part. <laughs> Gene Bose was just yeah. blown away. He couldn't believe yeah, it. He you said, know? you're giving me a snow job. That's what he said to Mike in the article. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, no, that's fascinating. And it, it's funny, if you have ever spoken uh, with uh, Dave Masterikas, he yes. and Mike were very tight in and around this time. Yeah. And he shared with me the letters that Mike sent him from Deland, Florida, when he was um, – I think it was 71, maybe. It okay. was there uh, training and the routine that, that uh, on the Nautilus equipment that Arthur put him on. And it was yeah. essentially that routine that he took to the America, hmm. which is pretty wow. cool. Yeah, I interviewed so, Dave. Yeah, three, in three days a week. And, and uh, uh, he didn't really deviate from three days a week. He did tell me in 1988, I remember asking him what his most productive routine was. And because um, he'd... Mike could run the gamut being a bodybuilding fan, like, like you and I, he was, he was into it, you know, whatever, yeah. what do you got? You know? And yeah. So he started out with a, a very basic routine. In fact, if you can remind me to come back to this later in our talk, okay. um, there's some points I want to examine with you. Um, but he did a, a basic routine that you got with your barbell set of York. He had a billard barbell set. Okay. And it was three days a week. It was, you know, two or three sets and exercise, about seven exercises. And as a youngster, as a 15 year old, his body just ballooned. Like he went from, I don't know, he gained something ridiculous, like 20 pounds of muscle in, yeah. in, in like a year or something. And, and yeah. uh, so it was pretty clear his genetics were good. And then he trained with power lifters and then he, he got the muscle magazines and he trained like Bill Pearl did. And then he, you know, he had pictures of Arnold, believe it or not, up on his wall and mm -hmm. trained like Arnold. And um, he knew Larry Scott's routine and everybody's routine. And then, you know, as a result of meeting Casey Vieter, um, and Casey trained basically the same way that Mike described to Gene Mose. Yeah. Um, it was an epiphany moment for Mike. It was like, like, well, wait a minute, I don't have to train this way. This is interesting. And he put him in touch with Arthur Jones. And Mike went to Florida after he got out of the Air Force and um, <clears throat> wrote these wonderful letters to, to Dave, uh, which he has preserved uh, quite a few of them, which are fascinating. Mm. The real time mm. pieces, you know, but that's how we train. Yeah. Yeah. Back then. yeah I, remember, I remember the pictures of Mike from the Teenage Mr. America. Um, or was it the Mr. America that Casey won? It might have been the Mr. America that Casey yeah, won. Yeah, in 71. 71, yeah. Won it, didn't it? Because yeah. I think him and Casey were the same age. So I think they were both 19 at the time. And yeah. um, I interviewed Dave Mastarakis, and uh, Dave told me that story too. He said right after that contest, he called up Dave and he said, uh, I was in the Mr. America and uh, I got 10th place or something. And, and Dave goes, wait a minute, you were in the Mr. America? He goes, yeah, but that's not important. He goes, what's important is I met this Arthur Jones and I got to tell you about this new training, you know, this new, new way to train. Yeah. He, he, oh, looked, yeah. he looked amazing at 19 years old, though. I mean, you're talking about his genetics. Oh, he looked amazing for 19. Oh, for sure. Always had uh, great proportions, very small waist. Yeah. Um, but I was, what I was going to, I'd gotten off track, which I have a tendency to do. He, um, Mike still maintained that three-day-a-week protocol. And when I asked him about his most productive routine, he, he was onto a, a split routine at that point, half, half okay. the body, one workout, day off, the other half, day off. Other okay. half. And then uh, he said, yeah. And the only difference was he said, I, I added an extra recovery day. In there. So rather than train Monday, Wednesday, Friday, it was, you know, Monday, Thursday, Sunday, whatever okay. it happened to be. Okay. So his adherence to those fundamentals of intense, brief and infrequent never wavered. 
And uh, I do see periodically on internet forums, you know, where people will say, oh, he never trained the way he advocated. You know, he was yeah, doing I the sets that of bodybuilding. That's nonsense. You know, it's not, yeah. usually it was said by bodybuilders that uh, were contemporaries who didn't really do much in, in terms of mail order business. And they were a little envious of that. Yeah. So of course what Mike was peddling was bullshit and what they're selling is the truth, you know? Yeah. But yeah. that wasn't the case. <laughs> yeah. Well, right after this uh, magazine, Mike went on to win the 76 Mr. America at IFPB. And I guess he made incredible improvement in that one year and he blew away. Uh, well, he beat Callard who beat him the year before. He also beat yeah. Danny Padilla. And I guess he looked amazing, you know, as far as the improvement he made in that one year. Yeah. Yeah. Almost unrecognizable according yeah. to some, you know, yeah. and, uh, uh, yeah, he, 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 he beat, uh, Callard and, uh, I don't think Robbie was in that contest. Mike, well, Robbie Mike, won it Mike, loved, Mike loved Robbie Robinson. He thought he? he was awesome. And, and, yeah. And, uh, he was in some respects, that was his bench, his measuring stick was Robbie. Mm. Okay. So, uh, he lost to Robbie in a night of the champions in 79 and said, you know, deservedly so. He said, Robbie looked amazing. I could tell yeah. when he took his shirt off, the contest was over. <laughs> but he also beat Robbie in, at a, one of the Grand Prix shows too. So yeah. they always had this rivalry, and, and Mike had huge respect for Robbie Robinson and his mm. physique. Yeah. Um, and he liked his character, actually. He mentioned that several times to me. That He said, you know, Robbie's, Robbie's got a good character. I really like the guy. So, um, you know, by contrast, there were, it's, it's funny, I, I asked him once, I was just out of curiosity, oh, you know, who are your friends, you know, in bodybuilding? And he said, oh, well, uh, uh, Boyer Co. He goes, geez, that's not really very many, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no. And he goes, no, it's funny, I don't have a lot of friends in bodybuilding. <laughs> he said, uh, I don't really have a lot of friends generally. He said, I, I tend to keep to myself. Yeah. But, um, he, you know, friendship for Mike, he didn't care to have a lot of friends, but the ones he had, he was very close to. So, yeah. Uh, you know, in that respect, people like Dave and myself and uh, a few others were fortunate to get into his inner circle, I guess. Yeah. Well, you know, it's amazing because I got into bodybuilding right at this time. And like I said, I, I remember everybody was doing this high volume training. And I don't know how many people actually, I don't think a lot of bodybuilders actually followed Mike's training verbatim. But I, he did really change the sport a lot because I think he, he did bring up this idea of intensity versus recovery. And I think it made everybody question, hey, why are we training six days a week? And why are we training 20 sets of bike? Is it because Arnold does it? You know, and because this is just the way it, it's done. And I yeah. think that's what it really was. I mean, that's why I was doing it. I was doing it because yep. Arnold did it and everybody else did it. But then when he started questioning that. it and then he started saying, well, he's right. I mean, we can't train long and hard. You know, you can't do yeah. that. And I remember it, it did, it did uh, affect everybody, I think, as far as recuperation goes. You know, like I know I started training four days a week instead of six. And my yeah. gains, I made much more gains. You know, I didn't, I didn't take the intensity into the level like he did, you know. But I, I did cut back on the amount of sets. I did have more rest days. And uh, I remember I talked to uh, Phil Williams, who, who won the Nationals in 1985. And Phil was living in St. Louis, and I guess Mike came over to George Turner's gym and did a seminar. And Phil at the time was training six days a week, too, because that's what George advocated. And yeah. Mike did the seminar, and he was saying about how you need more uh, intensity. And with the intensity, you have to take more recuperation. And Phil still follows that philosophy to this day. He'll, he'll take, like, one or two rest days after every training session, you know. And he said once he did that, it made a huge difference in his career, you know. Yeah. Well, a lot of it, like you say, was ritualistic. It was, you train that way because so-and-so from the past trained that way. Yeah. And he trained that way because someone else further back trained that way. Right. And it was all tradition and ritual. It had very little uh, science or even critical thinking applied to it uh, in terms of training. And um, like, you know, Arnold is a great case in point because he trained the way he did because Reg Park told him that's the way you train. Yeah. And so... It was he to question. Right. Um, and, and what I liked about Mike and, and people like Mike is that they were um, unique as individuals. Uh, there's a great quote from Mike, um, which is burned into my brain, which he said, you know, um, a conformist says, um, 
you know, I, I believe it because other people believe it. Mm -hmm. Nonconformist, you said, just as irrational, says, I don't believe it because other people believe it. Mm -hmm. right. said, but that rare third person, the individualist, says, I believe it because I can see for myself the reasons that it's true. Mm. And that was Mike. And those type of people generally are fascinating to be around. The, yeah. the conversation is the high, I mean, it's, it's the highest high of your life to be in that environment. Yeah. Um, because your, your synapses are firing and you're thinking of new possibilities and you, you know, you get creative and, but when it's just tradition based, it's stultifying. You yeah. Know, it's, well, that's it. There it is. You know, yeah. don't even think about it. That's right. That's all you need right there. Yeah. But I remember a friend of mine was big into Larry Scott when I was getting into weight training when I was a teenager and he had all Larry's courses and, you know, Larry Scott looked amazing, you know, and, uh, but it was 20 sets of body part. Mm -hmm. And I remember going through a couple of workouts with him like that and just thinking, you know what, I can't do this. There's no <laughs> friggin' way yeah. I'm going to be able to hit the gym six days a week for 20 sets of body part. Right. Like, even then, you know, it was like, yeah. this is ridiculous. So, yeah. um, of course, you know, if Arnold said it, then it was true for me. Yeah. You know, yeah. I bought his education of a bodybuilder. That was, that book was like holy writ to me, you know, right. And, uh, right. My older brother bought it for me and I poured over that and poured over that and the exercises Arnold advocated yeah. inclined presses for the upper pecs after doing bench presses and right. flies. And, um, I mean, and I will say this about Arnold is that, uh, he certainly is a great salesman. Uh, yeah. bodybuilding has never had a better salesman than right. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Right. Uh, Cause he sold me and millions like me uh, yeah. over the years. And I remember when, but, when uh, pumping iron came out, when he would do uh, interviews with like, the regular media, people didn't know anything about working out to, I think to uh, show the intensity or, of, or the dedication of a bodybuilder, he would say, I trained five hours a day, you know, yeah. I, I don't even think he trained five hours a day, but no. that, that's what he would, <laughs> he would, he would try to sell that. And then they would believe it. Like, Oh, they, they equated that with how much hard work this guy's putting in. And, and that still uh, endures to this day. Like for yeah. example, you're, you know, you, you have a great physique and I'm sure when you grow up, people say, Oh, John, you know, geez, you must work out every day. Right. Oh well, yeah, I, no, I don't. I that all the time. Know, but they expect that because if you're that much bigger than normal, you yeah. must be just putting in more time. Right. And Mike was the first one to say, you don't need the time. You need the effort. Yeah. And I liken it <clears throat> to, um, riding a bike, if you will, we've all had that experience. You can ride for hours on the flat. And if you're riding with another person next to you, you can carry on a conversation and you're not even aware that your muscles are working. Right. But then you come to a hill. And as you start to go up the base of the hill, suddenly you're aware there's something of a metabolic nature going on in your quadriceps. Yeah. And maybe the conversation now is a little stilted. <laughs> but it, you continue on, you continue on. And then when you get closer to the summit, your legs are on fire. Your, <laughs> your chest is heaving. Yeah. And you got to get off the bike because you can't complete the revolution of the pedals and you're panting for another 10 minutes afterwards. Right. Right. You could do hours of on the flat riding. Right. It's never going to have the effect of that last 40 seconds of riding up to the top of the hill. Right. Because right. when you're working against gravity, the muscles are working harder. Yeah. So the harder the work you do, the greater the metabolic effect, including muscle growth yeah. and or stimulus stimulation for muscle growth. And, um, that I think is, is what Mike was, was getting at was that it's that hard effort that you want. If you want bigger, stronger muscles, you got to empty the tank. Yeah. And the, you know, the gas comes out of the tank so gradually when you're riding on the flat or when you're doing low intensity work, mm -hmm. that it almost, I mean, owing to things like gluconeogenesis, it replenishes itself while you're going along. Yeah. But if you do something demanding, it, it empties out before your body has time to, to rectify that. And right. Consequently, your body doesn't like it any more than you do. So it, yeah. it, it takes steps to change that. But yeah, his thing was, it's like the, the you know, the um, about intensity and duration is that the harder you train, the faster you grow. But it's also true that the harder you train, the less amount of that training you can engage in. It's like yeah. the faster you run, the less distance you can run. Yeah. And that seems to me indisputable, you know, yeah. from a common sense standpoint. And you know, when I got into bodybuilding in the late seventies, you know, when I started talking to other bodybuilders, when I, the first gym I ever went to was a real small gym 
it wasn't an actual like real gym. It was a bunch of guys in a garage. I think it was like six of us or something, you know. But when we would talk to each other, everybody would train the same, you know. And I, I think that was happening around the world or around the country where everybody was just following the magazines. And I don't think guys knew as much about steroids at the time. We would look at these right. guys and think, this was just this is just training. You know, you gotta train six days a week. And I think there were so oh, yeah. many people that were so disappointed with their results and they, they weren't taking into account, you know, the genetics that Arnold had or the drugs, which was unknown right. pretty much at that time. Right. Nobody really knew about oh, yeah. the drugs. And Nobody I think when, and when Mike brought this into the intensity and the, how you have to have more rest, I think once people started doing that, even average people who had, you know, fair genetics, everybody was making progress off that. It was like a breath of fresh air. Yeah. Well, and the other thing that was refreshing about Mike was his candor. He, he never lied about anything, um, mm -hmm. which is rare, especially in the bodybuilding industry. You know? yeah. um, he was the first one to say, yes, you, you can buy my books and courses, which is great for me, but that's not a guarantee you're going to build a Mr. America physique. He said, because right. that is genetically based. He said, and if right. you don't have the genes, ain't going to happen. Right. And I remember interviewing him in his apartment. I'd gone to visit him from Canada. This is about 86. And I said, you know, your triceps are, you know, one of your most renowned body parts. I said, there. I said, is that strictly genetics or the way you train or is it steroids? He said, well, it's a combination of all three. He said, for sure. He said, you hmm. can't get that big rip gnarly look without steroids. Uh, hmm. He said, you just can't. He said, yeah. he, said he said, genetically, I've got good fiber density in my triceps and and I train them hard and that's why they respond. But he was very open about steroid use at a time when most bodybuilders were like, mm, don't talk about that. That's you know? true. Yeah. He, he even did articles in muscle builder about steroids. I remember that. Yeah. And, uh, but his attitude was, uh, he wasn't going to advise anybody on anabolics. He said, you know, I got enough trouble in my own life. He said, I, I can't, if that's, that's your decision, if you want to do it, do it. But yeah. He said, I'm, he said, I did it after, you know, careful consideration, weighing the pros and cons and thought that the, uh, the pros uh, outweighed the cons for me in that case. And I was monitored, not real closely monitored, but I made sure I was, you know, blood tested and, or blood pressure testing and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. And I thought the risk was minimal for, for me, he said. But he said each individual has to make their own decision on that. It's yeah. not, and he was not anti-steroid. He was, as he told me, he was anti-drug testing. He said, you know, I believe I was born a free individual and should be able to put into my body anything I want, even yeah. if it kills me, you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, and he said, you know, and so is everybody else. It's not my business to tell you steroids are good or bad. He goes, but I'll tell you this, and he was serious about it. He said, what pisses me off, he goes, more about this whole, this was back when I was talking to him about the time when the IFBB was implementing a drug ban or testing yeah and nice, nice. kind of went down a little bit yeah <clears throat> and he said what bothers me are people that take steroids and then lie about it that they yeah. don't take it yeah he said he said lying to me is more immoral than taking steroids is he goes <laughs> taking steroids is a personal decision you know he said right. but uh, and he, he mentioned a female bodybuilder who at the time was claiming that she never took steroids and he said you know it doesn't matter he said anyone who's a bodybuilder knows the look he said you're not fooling right. anyone Right, right. He said, so we know if you're taken or not, but lying about it. He goes, right. you know, that's, that was what, that was a pet peeve it is. Yeah. So yeah. when guys like Arnold or like Franco who denied it or minimized the role of steroids in their training would publish articles or be quoted on it, I mean, he just rolled his eyes. You know, he goes, yeah. these are our leaders in, in the sport that are advising the young up-and-comers about uh, the realities of bodybuilding. You know? Right, right. Right. So yeah, I remember he wrote an article about something and he was talking about his arms and he said his arms were like 18 and a half or something. I'm like, that can't be right. They got to be 20 inches. Like everybody had 20 yeah. cars back then, you know, but he, that just showed you how he was uh, very honest about everything. And he, oh, and he yeah. did put it out there. Yeah. Oh yeah. 18 and a half inches. And he said, and that, he said, and that was an accurate measurement. So my yeah. arm was cold and tape wasn't flip flopped or at an oblique angle. So I right. got a bit bigger measurement out of it. Right. right. So, yeah. uh, yeah, <laughs> his arms were his arms were ridiculously large. I, yeah. Again, when I visited him in his apartment, um, I remember he was sitting across on a couch from me, and we were talking about something. And 
he reached over to show me something, and it looked like his arm blocked out his body. That's that, 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 <laughs> that, that, across. Yeah, and I was like, you know, taken aback by it. But he was the first one also to talk about genetics because, uh, you know, he said, you know, guys with the right genetics, he said, can can do a lot in bodybuilding. He said, but guys that don't have the genetics, he goes, they can improve. There's no question. Yeah, but they're never going to look like a bodybuilder. Right. And uh, one of the, one of his indices for genetic potential happened to be bone size. Hmm. If you have thicker bones, you can anchor a, a bigger muscle, basically. Okay. And that that was brought home to me at the same time when I was visiting, because I had a swatch. You might remember those. those yeah. Little yeah. Plastic <laughs> watches, you know, the right. de rigueur at one point. And I just bought this, and I have tiny little wrist, and so I had you know, thing almost cinched right up to the face of the watch. <laughs> so I had this much hanging off. And Mike was in the kitchen and he came out and he caught his watch on something and it broke. And he goes, ah, shit, uh, you know, I broke my watch. I said, not to worry. I have a swatch. <laughs> and when I took it off and I said, look at all that extra band I've got there. I said, that'll fit you. He goes, it won't fit me. I said, what are you talking uh, about? I said, this is, <laughs> look, at, look, at the, look at this. I said, you know, you're not, your wrist isn't that much bigger than mine. So he said, well, okay, I'll show you. So he couldn't even close it around his wrist. Wow. Holy that's shit. how thick the bones were in his, right, in right. his physique. So, yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it was crazy, but that was, that was Arnold. So, or sorry, Arnold. That was not Arnold. That was Mike Mentz. Um, <laughs> what, what was uh, the he term just, he used, John, when you were talking about, when he was talking about his tricep? What, what was the term he used as far as his uh, Big muscle? ripped and gnarly. No, but you said he, he had, you were saying it was steroids, it was genetics, but in the oh, term of genetics, what, what, was, he, what yeah. was the term he used for his Muscle price? fiber density. Muscle fiber density, okay. M amount of fibers per, per square inch. Like, yeah. um, for, like all of us, even non-bodybuilders, we have certain muscle groups on our bodies that just have more fibers than most people's. Right. For me, it's always been my chest. Right. And you know, I wish it was, I wish it was uniform, but it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, other people, you see. Probably in some of your clients, if you train uh, even older clients, someone's going to have a big calf. Yeah. And it's all muscle. And they've never done a calf raise in their life. Right. Um, I had a guy who was a client and he was 65 and he had an 18 and a half inch calf. Hmm. And he'd never done a thing in his life for him. Right. Right. So it was almost ridiculous to say, oh, you better hit the calf machine there, buddy. You know, yeah. it was, there was nothing. Nothing there that would benefit them. And so bodybuilders have that muscle fiber density spread uniformly throughout all their muscle groups. And mm. the great ones have it through every muscle group. Like Sergio. So, yeah. You know, yeah, like a Sergio. Yeah. And then you have people like, uh, oh, who's a bodybuilder that has bad calves? I mean, not bad calves, but they just yeah. don't have the density. Yeah. yeah. They built them up as big as they can go, but there's no more fun. You can't stimulate into growth fibers that aren't there. Yeah. So, um, well, the guy that comes to mind right now is, uh, I'm thinking the guy that beat Mike at the 77 universe, uh, Cal Scalac. Yeah. Yeah. He had this great upper body, but his oh, yeah. legs, his legs were just never, they could never match no. up his upper body. No, he just didn't have the calves, you know, and, and yeah. or, or even the quads. For even the matter. quads. Yeah. Were, I, I went to a Boyer Co seminar once and Boyer Co said, he said he saw Cal train his, his legs or he might've wrote an article about it. And uh, he said he trains his legs super hard. He goes, it's not like he's not training them. It's not like he's neglecting them. He just doesn't have the genetics for it, you know. But yeah. that, that's an interesting concept, muscle fiber density. That's not talked about a lot, you know. And I think when people talk about genetics, they just say genetics, and that's just a, a general term. But they don't get into, they, you know, like different bone structures or muscle fiber density or things like that. Yeah. Well, and that, that's a biggie. I mean, that, if you don't, again, if you don't have the fibers there to develop, they're not going to. If right. You have... Like, for example, let's say I have, pick a number, uh, 400,000 fibers in my biceps. Arnold may have 800,000. Yeah. So, you know, he and I can build our arms and, and you know, effectively increase the size equally, but his are always going to be twice as big just yeah. because he's got more fibers in there. Right, right. And genetics isn't talked about, and it wasn't talked about until Mike came into the, the mix because there's no return on it. You can't, what, what can I market you? You know, yeah. if, if the genetics are the ultimate determinant right. of bodybuilding success, right, right. I can't sell you a supplement. I can't right. give you a special technique that's going to 
induce hyperplasia. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. going to, it's, that's the ceiling. And yeah. most of us, <coughs> not all of us, but most of us bumped up against that ceiling about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we keep looking around for a different technique that's going to drive up this adaptation because we, we don't want to let go of the dream, you know, yeah. but, uh, I think reality sets in or it did for me that, you know what, John, it ain't happening. <laughs> so, you know, if, if I've, if I've maxed out my muscular potential, however modest, it makes zero sense for me to try and up my training. Yeah. I'm not going to drive any further adaptation, but I am going to induce a lot of wear and tear on my body. Like I don't know any varsity athlete level athlete that isn't arthritic that hasn't had a hip replacement a knee replacement right um it's you know when the hinge joints in your knees and your elbows aren't that dissimilar from the ones in your door and you have a lifetime of normal use built into both of those now if someone goes out for a, a bicycle ride and that's their form of exercise it seems pretty innocuous. You don't get the pounding, you get running, you know, your muscles are working, but yeah. you're also opening and closing that knee joint with every revolution of the pedals. And even on a half hour bike ride, you can easily open and close that joint 10,000 times. Wow. So it's like going to your door and opening it 10,000 times, four days a week over and above its normal rate of use. Right. You're just going to wear out the hinges. And, yeah. Yeah. and I see that in bodybuilding. I think it's a, uh, it's an issue that, where the chickens will come home to roost for people down the road. When you're in your twenties and your cells regenerate relatively quickly, yeah, you're bulletproof. You don't really care about it, but yeah. it's almost like imperceptibly that switch gets shut off. You know, once you <laughs> exit your twenties yeah. <laughs> and then suddenly you get the, the odd ache and pain that's hanging around when it shouldn't be there. And right. the meniscus in the knee starts to thin out a little bit. <laughs> so uh, I, I think in, in my own opinion anyway, that uh, revisiting what Mike advocated and seeing how it might apply to you, to people generally is a good thing because you cut down on a ton of wear and tear. The amount of muscle you're going to build is fixed. It's genetically predetermined. We don't know how much it is until you, you train. Right. But at some point the end is coming. So, you know, as Mike said to me, rather than, trying to see how much training or exercise you can tolerate, you know, maybe take a look at how little is required. Hmm. And that was like, hmm, yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah. And <laughs> the one thing I think Arthur Jones lacked in, in promoting his uh, philosophy of training was, I mean, he had Casey Viador and I think he tried to get Sergio Oliva to follow his, his protocol, but I don't think Sergio really did, but uh, he didn't have like a, he didn't have a superstar bodybuilder who was winning contests. So when Mike started doing that and he won the universe and then he, you know, he was, and then he was in Joe Weider's magazine all the time because he was one of the editor in chiefs, I think. And he was writing articles every month. So he was constantly in the magazine and being featured on the cover. So now you had a guy who it, it was it proof that it worked. You know, he was following this training philosophy and he was winning contests. So I think that was I, I, really great for advocating what uh, Arthur Jones was uh, Oh, he, he did more promotion for Arthur Jones than anybody. Yeah. I mean, the reason I like Nautilus machines is because of Mike Menser, full stop. Right. I, Arthur Jones didn't interest me. Anything Arthur Jones had to say about exercise or bodybuilding that was of interest, I'd get it from Mike. Mm -hmm. He'd give me the Reader's Digest version. Yeah. But I didn't care that he hunted elephants. You know, I didn't care that he developed a, a steady cam thing for, you know, wild cargo uh, adventures. <laughs> Right. It didn't interest me. I, Mike Menser interested me because he right. was, you know, he was the guy on that. And um, uh, I mean, he did so much. For, he wrote the forward to Ellington Darden's book on bodybuilding for Nautilus. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I bought the book. Yeah. If it was uh, Bob Birdsong writing it, I probably wouldn't have been interested. You know, right. but it was Mike right. Menser. So um, he did a lot for Nautilus. Um, and it's too bad in a way it didn't work out for him there in 1983 when he went back because he could have been their best spokesman, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what happened with that? Didn't Arthur want to buy like a big <laughs> television studio and he wanted to do all these uh, things before cable television took off, right? Yeah, he had a massive TV station there. And his, his goal at the time, I believe, was, was twofold. One, he wanted to get a lot of programming out to 
what was then cable news. Yeah. And, and, and produce all of these shows. And number two, he wanted to sell his company. So he wanted to pump up the sales, get the numbers up, sell it, mm -hmm. you know, make money and get out. Okay. And he went to recruit Mike Menser uh, in Palm Springs at Mike's home in Palm Springs. Arthur went up to visit him and said, I want you to come work for me. I'm, you know, the future is going to be television. It's going to be video. I want you in on it from the ground floor. And at that time, I mean, it was good timing for Mike because he wasn't doing anything. You know, he'd been essentially blacklisted in bodybuilding. Yeah. Um, so, you know, his income at one point had been about 300,000 U.S. a year, which is good money back wow. in 1980. Wow, yeah, real good money. Mail order courses and seminars. Wow. And within four years, it was down to zero. You know, you know Mike, <laughs> Mike told me uh, that at one point, he was going into hotels early in the morning and eating scraps off room service trays. Gee. That's how bad it got. Yeah. So anyway, he was... He, he was, he went to the land and then Arthur basically didn't do anything with him. Just say, so yeah, film that workout, film that workout. And Mike was waiting for like, what, what are we doing? Like, what's the plan? You know, and, and there was no plan. Mm. So after about six months of that, I think Ray had a falling out with Arthur and thereafter Mike's enthusiasm petered out and he left and that was it. But wow. uh, it's too bad because once the company sold, the company that bought Nautilus also bought Schwinn Bike. Hmm. And their thought was, we have two brands we want to sell. Arthur Jones' view was Nautilus was total fitness. You get strength, you get range of motion or flexibility, and you get a cardiovascular benefit from training properly with resistance training. Hmm. The new owner said, no, no, no. Nautilus is strength training. Schwinn is our cardio. Right. And right. And then the next step was, you know, Arthur Jones said, my machines are as big as they are and as ugly as they are to do the job they need to do. And, but the new owners came in and said, Jesus, how much money do we have in steel? And yeah. this, unit, this is huge. Right. What about, what about these, these cams? Can we make, you know, use aluminum or hey, how about Kevlar? Let's get rid of those chains and uh, we'll pitch it as uh, smoother, less friction. Right. Less friction. I've never had a friction issue on a Nautilus machine. Whenever I've pressed the super slow people or anybody about these retrofits and all this, they point to a Nautilus machine where the, the bars that go up and hold the plates are warped. So you, you do a rep and the plate would go up and it, you know, it would, the bars would warp out and it couldn't go any higher. And like, oh, right. look at that friction. <laughs> That's not friction. You got you got a warp bar back there. You know, right. the Nautilus machines, the first generation Nautilus machines, put a lot of muscle on a lot of people. And uh, if that was friction, so be it. Um, it seemed to do the job. It provided right. resistance to contracting muscles. And that's right. uh, as Mike said, it made it easier to work harder. That's yeah. what they did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bodybuilding Heroes and Legends, Volume 1 by John Hansen is the book that celebrates the golden age of bodybuilding. This was the era in which legends such as Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sergio Oliva, Frank Zane, Robbie Robinson, Cal Skalak, and Mike Menser battled it out on stage for the biggest titles in bodybuilding. Read about some of the most exciting competitions that took place in the 1970s, including the Oliva-Schwarzenegger battles, Zane's first Olympia victory, and Scalac's controversial Mr. Olympia appearance, and much more. Filled with inspiring images of some of the greatest bodybuilders in the history of the sport, Bodybuilding Heroes and Legends Volume 1 is now available on Amazon.com or email John directly at naturalolympia at gmail.com.